All right. Well, good afternoon, everyone, and thanks for joining us for this April installment of the NHGRI DIR uh, seminar series. It's great to see all of you in the hall. Some people I haven't seen in a very long time, and thanks for all of you who are joining us uh, remotely. Our guest today is Dr. John Greeley. Uh, he is a professor of genetics and pediatrics at the Albert Einstein College of Medicine. Uh, he wears numerous hats, also serving as the chief of the division of genomics in Einstein's Department of Genetics, as a director of their Center for Epigenomics, and as an attending physician at the Montefiore Medical Center, which is located in the Bronx. Uh, his research program is centered on understanding models of genetic susceptibility to human disease, especially those affecting children. His group focuses on understanding phenotypes through uh, genetic or environmental influences that change the innate properties of a canonical cell type or perturbations that alter cell lineage choices during differentiation. His group also studies the effects of environmental and genetic influences on stem cell differentiation in order to understand the mechanisms of cellular memory and ultimately to reveal the functional variants in the non-coding majority of the human genome. It's a pleasure to have you, us, uh, you with us here today. John, we're all very much looking forward to learning more about your work and thanks for making the trip down from New York to be with us. Please join me in welcoming our guest today, Dr. John Greeley. Thank you all for coming. Thanks to you all who are on Zoom. I appreciate um, Sophia, who uh, was a graduate student in the West of Ireland, and uh, uh, I met her um, actually a long time ago through that connection. So the Irish connections obviously run very deep. Um, as uh, Andy was saying, I, I want to talk about variation in the non-coding genome. Variation in the non-coding genome, variation you think in terms of DNA sequence variation, but it's also how the, gen the non-coding genome is used, uh, which gets us into this area of epigenetics, and that's uh, one of my major foci. Uh, before starting, I want to do a land and labor acknowledgement, um, recognizing that I'm honored to visit the land of Piscataway and the Cotchtank Nations today, and that there aren't that many Piscataway and the Cotchtank in the audience because of the displacement uh, through the theft and genocide that's happened to our Indian, uh, Native American, Indigenous um, uh, family members. I also recognize that my economic foundation and that of many others is based on the enforced labor of slavery and the ongoing lingering injustice of this is anti-Black racism um, that affects our Black um, family members. So I hope that you're able to take away stuff from my talk today, which is interesting from the point of view of medical, medicine and science, but I'd also like to recognize that some of the stuff that um, is enabling me to be here <clears throat> is also uh, worth thinking about. So I'm going to bring uh, four components to this talk. The first part I've never talked about before in public, which is what we're doing with genomics in the Bronx. The um, Bronx, I'm going to argue, is um, possibly one of the most um, fertile places that we could be doing genomics research and medicine in the United States. Uh, so we'll see. we have a lot of initiatives, wanted to describe those. In terms of trying to understand human disease, which is what we're trying to do with these programs, um, I will talk to you about this field of epigenetics and then how the altered perspective that I've had to develop in epigenetics is causing me to apply new insights into how we interpret the results of uh, these so-called epigenomic assays. And then get into the part that I think is possibly the most interesting area within <clears throat> this large epigenetics uh, umbrella, which is what happens when you have a variant in the DNA sequence at a regulatory locus. So this is the Bronx. Uh, this is an income map in the Bronx. And the, for those of you who don't know New York City, you can see the Bronx because it's at the top and it's quite pale. The uh, Bronx is diverse. 9% of the Bronx looks like me, Northern European white. 91% is everything else imaginable. And it's going to get even more diverse with time because what you're seeing is that a lot of the older folks are disproportionately Northern European white. We're going to see this non-gentrifying borough become more um, diverse with uh, the passage of, the, of years. It's where the poor and immigrant populations live. 26% uh, of the Bronx residents live in poverty. And in fact, it's 36% in 
in Congressional District 15 in the South Bronx, which is the poorest congressional district in the United States. It's just across the Harlem River from some of the most wealthy people on planet Earth, and these uh, patients of mine do not deserve to live like this. 34% of the Bronx residents are foreign born, and quite a few are undocumented and uninsured. And this, these are the languages spoken in the Bronx. Um, the North Bronx uh, is largely English speaking as the primary language. The South Bronx would be mostly Spanish speaking. But if you take away those two primary languages and you ask, what's the third most common set of languages spoken? Yellow is West African. We have very substantial West African uh, communities uh, throughout the Bronx. What makes us have a very interesting position within the Bronx in the health system and the medical school is that we're basically on our own up there. There are some city hospitals, but otherwise Montefiore Medical Center is the sole provider of uh, care within the Bronx. And the medical school, which is very research intensive, lots of NIH grants, is right in the middle of the communities that are the most diverse in the United States. So we have had um, people, you know, the usual sus suspects approach us to say, we'll sequence hundreds of thousands of your individuals in the Bronx. There'll be millions of dollars worth of sequence that we can give to you. And we've declined those offers. So we don't have sequence of everybody in the Bronx. And it's because we have a set of principles in the health system that uh, have to be adhered to before we'll, we'll have a partner uh, work with us. And these are largely the ones that you would have seen in other um, uh, uh, venues for. Uh, but the top one is very important. And so it's part of the trust with the community where we say the reason for health disparities affecting black and brown people is not because of black and brown DNA. It is because of racism and socioeconomic um, structural inequalities that have been built up. Everything else here, you probably recognize uh, as good general principles that you would have heard in other uh, fora. So we have got some very good partners that we have welcomed. Um, I've managed to set up um, with colleagues at Einstein and Montefiore, a clinical uh, testing service for every new cancer diagnosed in the Bronx through Caris Life Sciences, which allows us to get exome and transcriptome sequencing on every new tumor that's diagnosed and uh, have genomically directed uh, tailored therapy for uh, these patients. We have been inventive in terms of finding sources of genomic information. Um, Sri Raj is an extraordinarily brilliant uh, population geneticist who works with me. And we have been working with the All of Us data, um, the release before today's big announcement, which doubled the number of people and, and genomes that are out there. Um, but this, uh, as you can see, shows a great diversity of the genomes in New York City. And you'll see that within the Bronx, oops, there is a relatively small number of people who have only blue in their genomes, which would be the Northern European white folks, um, much more so than, say, <clears throat> Manhattan, Queens, and Brooklyn. So uh, all of us is, is uh, a laudable approach in so many ways because it has placed the LC issues of sequencing um, at the forefront, which has made it attractive to us. So what Shri has done with these sequences is she's done some identity by descent uh, analysis to look to see where the more re related groups of people exist within these 13,000 genomes. And it's prompted in part by the recognition of clinicians like myself that what is rare globally can be common locally. So if I have a patient who turns up in my clinic and they've got albinism, I don't think of the typical textbook uh, causes of albinism. I ask if they've got Puerto Rican ancestry, and I look for one of the two hermansky pudlak genes, because those are founder effect mutations in, um, in the Puerto Ricans. Likewise, a child comes in Puerto Rican ancestry who has um, short stature, skeletal dysplasia. The first thing I think of is Steele syndrome. So founder effect mutations, uh, variants that cause disease that are enriched in a population that you serve in your health system, you need to know about. So this is why what Shri did was she looked to see what's happening in New York City in general. So these are um, clusters, the size is the number of people, the distance is the FST, the relatedness, and it makes a lot of sense. Europeans with Europeans, African with African and so on. And the one that I like to focus you on is this South Caribbean group here with African ancestry. And through our colleagues at Mount Sinai, we were able to uh, deduce that these are Garifuna, South Caribbean, a very specific ethnic group from the South Caribbean. And I want to point out that the uh, 
the cardiomyopathy variant that is at the top of the list there has been previously described by our Mount Sinai colleagues, um, uh, but not yet published. So I want to give them uh, appropriate uh, attribution. But what you can see here is that in the top list of genes, is all of the things that you'd recognize to be variants associated with disease in Ashkenazi Jewish individuals. And these are known founder effect mutations, although we are picking up some that have not been previously described in Ashkenazi Jews. And pretty well everything that we're going to find in these uh, underrepresented groups represents uh, new founder effect variants. So the ability to go into populations and to understand the specific patterns of disease that you should be seeing in them in the rare disease space is also a possibility. We want to get a better sense of what the genomics looks like in the Bronx. And we have an ongoing study, de-identified specimens, 3,000 of them that represent the 25 zip codes of the Bronx, proportional to the population of each zip code. And that's going to give us two axes of information. One is, where in the world did all of these uh, genomes come from? And how have they become admixed? And it gives us a real granular view of where we, we think uh, the uh, complexity and opportunities exist within the Bronx. And we know that the Garifna, for example, have a big community here in the central Bronx. So um, the other thing is to have the Bronx become uh, a laboratory for environmental exposures and how it interacts with disease and genotypes. The, uh, we, our partners, Aklima, have um, been driving convert, uh, uh, hybrid vehicles up and down the, the streets of, of uh, the Bronx, as you can see on this map. And they have about 16, I believe it is, sensors for different types of pollutants. And they just shared this with me as preliminary data. Um, they still haven't completely covered the Bronx, as you can see. But what you can see running west to east like a gash through the Bronx is Robert Moses' uh, Cross Bronx Expressway. And those big red lines are the big highways that run through the Bronx. But even in the back streets, you can see that there are a large number of communities where there's a huge amount of this uh, PM 2.5 pollution. And in fact, if you look down here, this is the food distribution area for the entire of New York City, the Hunts Point area, where the big trucks go to deliver and pick up food, and the pollution down there is, uh, is, is dreadful. So the other thing that has to happen better in general, but in particular in my communities in the Bronx, is to improve on our poor genomic diagnostic rates in rare diseases. Uh, Montefiore is an unusual place to practice genetics because we're a pioneer accountable care organization. Only 15% of the Bronx is commercially insured. The rest is either uninsured or government insured. So in effect, Montefiore is the insurance provider for the majority of our patients. So if I need to order an exome or a whole genome, I, am, I don't have to go through a pre-authorization process with a commercial insurer. So I can order anything. And what happens is I can order exomes and I still get this very low diagnostic rate. So it's not because of the lack of testing in the Bronx, it's because of the fact that we're just not able to make diagnoses. So we formally studied this in our CSER 2 project, uh, NYC KidSeq, and as you can see, the overall diagnostic rate was about 18%, and these are kids presenting with neurological, cardiological, immunological problems, the bread and butter of any sort of clinical service. And why this is the case, the DDD study out of the UK that came out last week, even in the um, abstract, I could see things that were resonant. There is the um, things that were determinants of their diagnostic success included trios. If you have both parents, you're going to do more, more to make diagnoses. Because of instability of families who have poverty, um, we only have about 55% of our patients who from whom we can get samples from both parents. So immediately half are look, are facing a struggle to get a diagnosis. And maternal diabetes is rampant in the Bronx, and um, most of the Bronx uh, has, as part of its heritage, African ancestry. So there are many good reasons why it's difficult to make these diagnoses in the Bronx, and it means that if we can solve those problems there, uh, we can uh, show the way for a lot of other people. So we're setting up the New York Center for Rare Diseases through Montefiore and Einstein. It's, and we have three good partners there, GeneDx, the diagnostic company, PacBio, do long read sequencing, and Google. And what we're going to do in this is have uh, three sets of innovations. I'm very interested in how we can do advanced phenotyping of our patients, especially patients who have not been represented in the dysmorphology textbooks. Um, so there's a lot of natural language processing we want to do, um, uh, uh, harvesting of HPO terms, working with facial imaging, and so on. 
Um, we are going to do long read DNA and RNA sequencing, and we're going to build advanced analytical approaches for these data and make that an open sandbox so that if people have good ideas, good products that we can add into this uh, analytical system uh, so that they can try and help us deduce what's going on in our patients in the Bronx, we will be happy to have those um, dropped into the, um, into the sandbox. And here's the other issue. Right now, we only make diagnoses based on uh, the 3% of the genome that encodes pro uh, proteins. Uh, it's 97% of the genome remains a mystery to us. But if you've got the FBN1 gene, you've got a patient whose family has had multiple aortic dissections. There's nothing showing up in the coding sequence of this and related genes. Um, I want to know what's happening at that promoter, but I also want to know how would I know whether something that's happening at that promoter is it uh, could it be damaging in some way? So that's going to be the last part of the talk today. So, of course, when you have a low anything genetic that doesn't explain phenotypes, whether it's GWAS or whether missing heritability or low diagnostic rates um, with uh, rare diseases, somebody is bound to say, but what about epigenetics? What about epigenetics indeed? Um, so let me talk to you about non-coding DNA and transcriptional regulation. I'm trying not to use the word epigenetics as much as possible because I've evolved very much how I think about this very ambiguous term to the point that I took a sabbatical back in 2014, 2015, just to try to straighten out my head about how we should be doing this kind of work. And the insights that I generated during that period of time have proven to be um, what, I've current, what, what I'm currently using. First of all, though, I want to give you a bit of history. Um, I'm hopefully, hopefully going to have this book on epigenetics coming out um, sometime in 2023. I'm mocking up a cover there. It just happens to use the Irish colors. Thank you very much to the artist who gave me that. Um, but I want to give you the history of epigenetics and why the term itself is just, you know, it's, it's, there's nothing special about it. So the early 20th century, the embryology community had just kind of got past the idea of preformationism. They they knew that there wasn't a homunculus in a in a in a gamete that specialized structures were formed from non-specialized precursor cells, and this was the process of epigenesis. But then the the um, geneticists came along and they said, "Hey, we irradiated this mouse, and it has a T hairpin uh, uh, phenotype in its tail, or we irradiated these Drosophila, and they have these white eyes." Um, What's interesting is when we breed these animals, their offspring also have the same phenotype. So that genetic material the, in the nucleus, those chromosomes must have something to do with heritability. And the, uh, the embryologists went wild. They were, they were pretty hostile to the idea that their turf was being invaded by these geneticists. And I've read some of the uh, accounts of this time and they're using Nazi Germany Im image uh, language to describe the geneticists. It was, it was for some reason completely out of control. So in steps Conrad Hal Waddington. Um, pro tip, smoke a pipe. You look so intellectual. Um, Waddington was a dropout from his PhD program in geology in Cambridge, and he was a dabbler. He decided that he would go over and start dabbling in biology because he found it a little bit more interesting. Uh, as part of his dabbling, and he was a very successful dabbler, he, he eventually got a doctoral degree based on published work, but he, he went over to Germany to work with Hans Spiemann, uh, he of the Spiemann organizer, classically trained embryologist, leader in the field. But he also got a grant to go out and visit Caltech, where two of the former members of uh, Morgan's fly room at Columbia had ended up, uh, Alfred Sturtevant and Theodo Theodosius Dobzhansky. So he learned what they were doing from a classical genetics point of view. Um, and he was unique for having a foot in both camps, so both of these warring camps. And so in true Rodney King style, he said, why can't we all get along? And here was his solution. He said, imagine this landscape and a ball is rolling down, it's making these decisions. That's like epigenesis, right? It's like cell fate determination, differentiation decisions and so on. But imagine that this landscape is pulled into place by these guy wires. And those guy wires are shaping the landscape, creating the cell differentiation potential. But if you snap one of them, it changes. So that snapping a guy wire is like mutating a gene. And that's why you can have altered cell fate, altered morphology, and it's epigenesis meets genetics. It's an epigenetic landscape model. And that is a really simple and somewhat boring model. And gravitationally, it's very implausible because for some reason, he thought 
gravitation would be pulling the ball down the hillside, but the guy wires were were acting on a landscape that was trying to go upwards. So while he dabbled a lot, he obviously never went over to the physics department. So David and Annie, about 10 years later, um, after a 14 hour propeller plane ride from New York to Paris, um, was describing to a Greek speaker um, why he wanted to call his cytoplasmic inheritance of matent type locus characteristics in tetrahymena paragenetic, and was told that that was ling linguistically incorrect and he needed to call it epigenetic, and he did. And so this was the second uh, use of the term, and he was absolutely right. We now know it's an siRNA mediated mechanism of the cytoplasm, um, but he uh, introduced the idea of epig epigenetics as a cellular memory phenomenon. Um, and again, this kind of came and went until the 20th, uh, 1970s, when John Pugh uh, resurrected the term. So this is one of two pictures you'll ever see of John Pugh. Um, he's the longer haired guy in the glasses there. Um, John was a, another dabbler. He was working with Robin Holiday in the MRC in North London, and he was meant to be working on recombination repair, but he was fascinated by X chromosome inactivation, Mary Lyon's work, and he couldn't figure out a mechanism for how a, a signal early in life could be propagated to later in life. Um, but he went to see Ruth Sager, who was doing a, a sabbatical in London at the time, and she was talking about her work with restriction modification systems. And she was talking about the modifications being the addition of these covalent uh, groups to uh, the DNA sequence. And that was John's aha moment. He said this could be, if it's passed on to the daughter um, uh, chromatids, this could be a way of maintaining a memory of a prior event. So he went back to Robin Holiday. And Robin said uh, a couple of years later, okay, we're ready to write this up as an abstract for the Royal Society. So that's me and John Pugh and Bethnal Green just before the pandemic. And um, I said to John, uh, why did you use the word epigenetic? And he said, I had a 200 word limit. I needed to be able to talk about mutation being a change in the nucleotide. And I needed to be able to talk about it being a change in the presence or absence of this covalently added methyl group. And so I called it epigenetic. I said, were you inspired by David Nanny? or, or uh, Conrad Waddington. And he said, I'd never heard of either of them. So here's the, here's the problem. Uh, oh, and then the other thing, of course, is Robin Holiday uh, ultimately started to talk about uh, epigenetics and this DNA methylation as something involved with genetic regulation. And that became the, the definition that, that he ran with uh, over time. So the word epigenetic was independently come up with by these three individuals. It, in our evolutionary biology uh, colleagues would say that this is like convergent evolution. Um, there is no thread that carries through to the, uh, these three individ uh, individuals and their, and their use of the word. And Art Riggs, who passed away about a year ago, um, wonderful scientist, he was coming up with exactly the same ideas about um, DNA methylation and X chromosome inactivation, but uh, to my uh, eternal uh, admiration, I never used the word epigenetic. So why do we think that epigenetic mechanisms uh, uh, mediate disease? And these mice here are enormously um, uh, influential in this field. You can see the one on the left is not only yellower, it's bigger. So this was experiment, these were experiments done on the viable yellow mouse. And um, what you would see in a litter was a mixture between these uh, obese, met metabolically um, disturbed animals um, and other animals that looked like they didn't even have any any uh, uh, mutation at all. Um, and it was because there's a retrotransposon that it landed upstream from the non agouti gene. And if it was constitutively active, it was causing the phenotype. If it was silenced through these regulatory mechanisms, the mouse looked like it didn't have a mutation at all. And um, uh, what George Wolf did in Arkansas was he fed these animals the, this uh, high single carbon donor diet in uh, the pregnant mother, and he was able to shift the balance from the uh, yellow mice over to the pseudo agouti mice and, uh, and uh, influence their adult phenotypes. So think of what this means. It means that an environmental exposure mediated through some sort of effect on the expression of this retro element was leading to a phenotype later in life. So there's a memory component to it as well. And when DNA methylation was shown to be involved with the silencing of the IAP element, it seemed to tie all of this epigenetic regulatory mechanism stuff together. So I think this is probably the most influential model that we, we uh, kind of grew up with. So let's think about 
what we're saying here. We're saying that there's some sort of extrinsic influence to the cell, and what it's reflected by is some sort of change in either chromatin structure, uh, DNA methylation, and a change consequently in gene expression. So that's that's how we think about it, right? That's that's the model that's in our head. Um, what's what are we considering happening at the cellular level? So if you've got a healthy individual and a diseased individual or an exposed individual, um, and this what we think is that cells have reprogrammed cells have changed their dna methylation their chromatin structure their gene expression um, and that this is a what i will call cellular reprogramming so the idea then became that if cellular reprogramming has occurred we should be able to look at these molecular events that regulate uh, the cells and if we find changes in the individuals of the disease that's proof for the hypothesis wrong the problem is, and we've done so many of these genome-wide, uh, sorry, epigenome-wide association studies um, that have ended up being uninterpretable. And it was one of the reasons why I took a sabbatical, because I didn't know what the hell we were doing. Um, one of the reasons you can have these changes of DNA methylation has nothing to do with cell uh, reprogramming, is that you just have a change in the proportion of cells that are methylated at this allele, where they become go from being a high proportion to a low proportion, and the bulk change is going, the bulk pattern is going to show high methylation to low methylation, but there is no actual reprogramming of any cell. The other thing um, is that you, you could have DNA sequence variance effects. Sorry, let me just go back. Um, and where on one allele here, we've got a SNP, which is shown in blue, another in red, and everything nearby is unmethylated. On the other allele, it's methylated. Sequ the DNA sequence polymorphism uh, effect is nothing to do with cellular reprogramming. It's just the genotypes driving, driving these changes. So, and so then I started thinking, well, why did you choose this particular locus in, in, in response to this environmental stimulus? Uh, because DNA methyltransferases, TET oxidases, chromatin uh, remodelers and modifiers, they have no sequence specificity, nor do you want them to have any sequence specificity because they have to go to different places in different cell types, right? And all with the same genome. So what we're probably looking at is the footprint of transcription factor biology, where the transcription factors are either binding or not. And that's what's being reflected by the chromatin changes and the DNA methylation changes. And the way that they change the, the chromatin DNA methylation is basically by re recruiting enzymatic complexes. This is just well-known biology, but for some reason, we weren't putting it together in our heads with all the DNA methylation and chromatin stuff. And this is a, a paper from uh, John Stamatoyanopoulos in the University of Washington that I think kind of got a bit lost because it came out early in the pandemic. But what John did was he found all of the nuclease sensitive sites in, in um, uh, basically the open chromatin, several hundred human cell types. He was able to show where the actual uh, transcription factor was binding because he was using DNAs and it gives a specific fig fingerprint. And then he went into the top med data and asked the question, what is happening at these loci? Are these under purifying selection? They're less uh, variable than other re regions around it or, or otherwise. And he showed that they're actually massively increased in their diversity compared with the 200 base pairs flanking. So the, the loci where these transcription factors are binding are highly polymorphic between all of us, sorry. And uh, so it's completely unsurprising that we would have differences in chromatin structure, DNA methylation, and so on um, at these loci. And then the next question becomes, well, if transcription factors are so important, what regulates transcription factors? So some transcription factors are nuclear hormones, something binds them in the cytoplasm, they get into the nucleus, blah, blah, blah. But many, if not most, are actually living downstream of cell signaling pathways. So what I like to think now is that if we can infer from our genomic information what the transcription factors are that are mediating whatever it is we're looking at, and we know something about which cell signaling pathway is acting on that transcription factor, we have an insight into the cell signaling that could be associated with this phenotype. So this is where I would plea with you to stop doing hypothesis-based research. What I think you should be doing instead is question-based research. And this PMID here is work from uh, David Glass, where it's very philosophical, but he's saying, if you have hypothesis-based research, not only can you fail, but you can also, you'll also be biased towards trying to swerve your results towards uh, proving your hypothesis. But if you have a question-based research where you say, I'm open to these other influences other than cellular reprogramming, being informative in terms of understanding the pathogenesis of the disease or the mechanism of the phenotype, then 
If you're open to all of those, you don't call them confounders, you're going to get insights and you will succeed. So I think this is a very useful way of thinking about how to do genomics in general. Um, and it, it is, um, it, it's definitely the way that we should be thinking about it with this complex uh, set of things that we talk about with functional genomics. So I'm going to give you a few vignettes of how this altered perspective has helped us with a few studies. The first one is a very simple study. Infected toxoplasma gondii into some human cells and looked to see what was happening to the host transcriptome and chromatin. And the, we also looked at the toxoplasma itself, although I won't show you that. Um, so we did RNA-seq and attack-seq in bulk. And uh, what you see, first of all, is this massively overexpressed gene, an extracellular met matrix metalloprotease, Adam TS15. And it and some other members of its family are uh, overexpressed as a result of the toxoplasma infection. That's kind of interesting because when you dissolve the extracellular matrix, you allow the cell to kind of slide within the tissue. And that's thought to be part of helping to spread the infection within the tissue. When we looked at the, um, the other... Uh, upregulated genes, they fell into three main categories. Immune, which you expect because the cell is fighting off an infection, but also cell division and metabolic processes. And we're interested in the metabolic in particular because toxoplasma is an oxytroph. It can't make all of the nutrients it requires for its own survival. It needs to use those from the host, um, the host cell. So the idea that it was inducing expression of some host cell genes involved with metabolism was uh, really interesting from that point of view. So again, with this transcription factor centric idea, we took the attack seq data, looked for the overrepresented motifs, and FOSB, JUNB is AP1, uh, REL A represents NF kappa B, and REB1 is uh, RAS related um, uh, uh, protein, uh, pro transcription factor, basically. And we asked then the question well, uh, which genes are associated pr preferentially with each of these transcription factors? And while the NF kappa B response was solely, as we as far as we could see, an immune response, the other is as well as inducing immune responses, um, the uh, AP1 was involved with cell division uh, genes and uh, also metabolic genes, while um, the RAS related pathway was really focused on the extracellular matrix. So this is our model. Now, instead of thinking in terms of what the genomic information is telling us on its own, we're working our way back to transcription factors and cell signaling. We already know that there are some uh, uh, molecules secreted by toxoplasma that inf influence uh, P38 and AP kinase, um, but uh, we know that we should be looking for things that influence ERK1 and 2 and uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the SAP K Jun MAP kinase pathways as well, because they're upstream of the, the Jun and RAB1. So that's one vignette. The second is, um, and that's reprogramming of cells. This second one here is just to illustrate um, something quite simple uh, that you can have altered cell subpopulations within a population of cells. So we were taking CD4 positive T cells from peripheral blood from younger and older individuals. This is a study of aging where epigenetic events are thought to be uh, important. We did single cell RNA-seq and we saw that there was one group of cells that seemed to decrease with age and another that seemed to increase with age. And it will be of no surprise whatsoever to uh, people with a bit of an insight into immunology that you lose naive uh, CD4 positive T cells with age and you gain cytotoxic T cells with age. So this I'm just putting in to illustrate that I'm not um, ignoring the uh, cell subtype effects that can occur uh, to confound your cellular re reprogramming ideas. Um, but this is all, all also the first 12 of 400 single cell RNA-seq experiments that uh, my graduate student uh, uh, Marlia Tomatos has done. And this is going to be an amazing data set to study for aging. I want to uh, Fordham University is also in the Bronx. Um, Maria Kundakovic is an extraordinarily talented um, uh, neuroscientist, and she was resistant to the idea that uh, why is it that we're so uh, uh, we we just take female mice out of neuro uh, neuro behavioral experiments because their their behavior is variable depending on when they where they are in the estrus cycle. She said, let's positively use that as a, as a physiological. Um, model that could be studied and it has relationships to things like anxiety, depression, and so on. Um, so it is well known that if you're in a low estrogen state as a female mouse, you are much more timid, whereas the high estrogen state, which is a, a like a four to five day period, um, uh, causes you to be much more bold and uh, less anxious. 
Um, there are actually some cellular phenotypic changes that she's found. The ventral hippocampus actually undergoes a lot of dendritogenesis in response to the estradiol being at high levels, and that regresses as when the estradiol goes down. So there's uh, this amazing remodeling that's happening of den uh, dendritic connections in the ventral hi hippocampus. So we helped her with the attack seek on the nuclear uh, nuclei that were new N positive, so neuronal nuclei from the ventral hippocampus. And what we saw there was some loci were starting off closed and becoming open. Others were open and becoming closed. And this was happening over a four-day period, a really beautiful demonstration of the dynamism that can happen in these cells that are fixed in the brain. It's not like they're, they're circulating cells and being replaced by other cells. Um, and the genes nearby were uh, increasing and decreasing their expression as part of this process. So again, what do we look for? We looked for the transcription factors that were present at these loci that were changing their chromatin states. And while there were a lot of the MEF2 transcription factors, one, one thing that you don't see here is the estrogen response element. And the thing that you do see here is EGR1. And when Maria saw this, she says, I know what's going on. So estradiol combined to one of two receptors. One is the nuclear receptor for estradiol, which is present in the, in the cytoplasm. And the other is the membrane-bound version. And if the membrane-bound version gets, gets uh, bound, it kicks off a number of kinases, in particular MAP kinase and ERK, uh, which control EGR1. So when she saw EGR1 lighting up, she realized that this is the way that the estradiol was probably working. And she subsequently showed that the, um, that the membrane um, uh, was where the estradiol was binding. Um, and then the final vignette is to look at one of these endocrine disrupting chemicals, a chemical called um, tributyltin, uh, which is a, an obesogenic uh, agent in everything from C. elegans to mammals. Um, so Taylor Thompson um, made this the focus of her uh, MSTP project, and she wanted to understand what was happening at the regulatory level, because it was thought that what was happening with TBT is that it was binding to PPAR gamma RXR, and that by doing this, it was facilitating its action and causing a dipogenesis. So we wanted to know, is it doing this by um, speeding up the binding, by binding at a top of loci? Uh, we were bought into this model. This uh, principal component analysis plot here is showing the, the variation that you see with, with expression over the, the uh, several time points. Regular differentiation, as, as shown with the red line. We used a PPAR gamma agonist, rosiglitazone, and showed that uh, there really wasn't that much of a difference in terms of gene expression. But when you hit these cells with tributyltin, they really started to um, change um, in many ways. So what you're seeing here is gene expression differences, but what you don't see is that they also became hyperplastic, hypertrophic, hypertrophic um, increased amount of uh, lipid within them earlier. And um, when we looked at the gene expression patterns, it looked like there was beijing of the, um, of the adipose tissue. It started off as white, um, and then this was in, uh, inducing genes that were associated with beige ad adipose tissue. So it's almost like it's a, a different cell type that's being produced. When we looked at the uh, data, and I'm summarizing an awful lot in this one slide, we did not see any evidence for PPAR gamma RXR activation. What we did see was decreased TED transcription factor activity. And the TED transcription factors are, um, uh, are associated with adipogenesis. We also saw a big RAS-related GTPAs response. And both of these independently were saying to us, something's happening with the actin. Uh, there's uh, presumably some sort of damage to it. So what David has done is he's gone and he's started to look at what's happening with the F-actin in the cells. And he's showing that there is damage, which is um, related to the uh, dosages that Taylor was using in her experiments. So now let's finish with the last section, which is, uh, I think the it's a less complete story but it's so fascinating that I thought I'd put it in front of you today because it's, it's, it's uh, I think, where we need to be thinking about a lot of questions going forward. We have been developing this thing which we call the regulatory landscape and enrichment analysis approach. So if you have certain things that should be randomly distributed in the genome, are they non-randomly overlapping the open chromatin regions of one or more cell types? Um, so we used to do this through a permutation analysis approach um, so for, you know, 52 cell types, we're doing a thousand uh, permutations um, for, you know, uh, each of the uh, sets of loci of interest that we're putting in. 
that becomes computationally very uh, expensive. So we've because we have enough observations, we were able to use a central limit theory approach. And now what used to take um, 10 hours is three seconds. Um, so this is a package that we'll be releasing shortly, uh, generated by Eric and Sam. And this is uh, work that we're doing with Donald Shea and Cahal Shoiga back in Ireland. Um, so we decided we'd focus on the trait of autism, neurodivergence. Um, and you can see the numbers of individuals. Basically, we 7,637 individuals with autism, and we looked at de novo variants with the assumption that they should be randomly distributed in the genome. We looked at 52 cell types, and we performed these permutation tests, and we also performed the central limit theorem approach, um, and we had concordant results. So what did we find? What we found, I think you can ignore the missing siblings uh, column on the left because it's actually a very small number of individuals. But what you see for almost all the cell types in almost all these cohorts, whether affected or unaffected with autism, is that we were seeing significant enrichment for de novo variants in cis-regulatory elements of all of these cell types. So this was blowing our minds a little bit because how in sperm or in egg do you know that this locus here is going to become an enhancer in a liver cell or in a, a breast epithelium cell or whatever it might be? What is the, how is that marked in some way? Um, so this is very consistent with John Stamatoy and Opus's ideas, right? Because if your de novo variants are landing right in cis regulatory regions, of course, you're probably going to have increased nucleotide diversity. And perhaps it could be related to where the transcription factor is actually binding. Um, this is also something that made me think of Ryan Hernandez's work, where because by definition, these are extremely rare variants if they're de novo variants. And what Ryan was showing was that the uh, it, the effect that you get on the heritability of gene expression is, you know, it's there, but it's low until you get to ultra rare variants, variants that are N of zero or N of one in NOMAD. Um, so um, are we potentially identifying these um, variants that are have an increased effect on uh, DNA methylation, chromatin structure, and gene expression. So the clue that we got was when we looked at the, the triplet, uh, triplet uh, context of these variants. And what you can see is everything with a little red CG in it is, is uh, one of these triplets that has a CG. The vast majority of the of the variants were of the de novo variants are happening in a CG context. Um, so this is a, a highly mutable sequence in the genome, obviously, because if it's methylated and you lose, you deaminate it. Instead of uh, deaminating uh, cytosine to uracil, it deaminates to thymine, and it's very difficult to repair because of the um, because of, you you don't uh, the machinery doesn't recognize it as being foreign to the DNA sequence. So this. We then looked at the uh, ultra rare variants in TopMed, where there is zero to n equals zero in NOMAD. They weren't found in NOMAD. Exactly the same pattern. And when we looked at those TopMed rare variants by window, they're they're clustered. So we think that what we're seeing is clustered CGs in the genome. And for anybody who's spent any time looking at the genome, and I think that this place people probably have, um, we recognize these to be like CPG islands, the regulatory elements of genes. Um, and as such, they are um, uh, more likely to have transcription factor binding sites. So that's John Stamatoy and Optus's uh, observations explained. And they're more likely to have regulatory effects on, on genes if, if you're enriching for, say, promoter sequences. So that's Ryan Hernandez explained. So we're, we think that we're uh, probably looking at de novo variants, which are, um, they're, they're, they're marking, they're ending up as cis-regulatory loci in somatic cells not because the chromatin is marked in some way during gametogenesis, but because of base composition, which makes a lot more sense. So we then ask the question, when these events occur, what, are the what do the genes nearby look like? And there are about 162 genes that the Spark uh, folks have put together that say these are autism genes. And what we're able to um, focus in on were the ones where the, um, the cis-regulatory elements um, within 10 kb of the transcription start site with a de novo variant, what we are now calling de novo regulatory variants or DNRVs, um, were enriched in these 13 cell types here. So now what we're doing is we're trying to figure out how to predict whether these de novo variants are, or de novo regulatory variants are damaging. And we're taking some inspiration from Stefan Sanders' uh, approach, which is the category-wide association study approach. 
Um, and what we're looking at here is uh, de novo regulatory variants from two separate individuals with autism in, in these cohorts. And they're, they're sort of side by side at the KRAS gene, which causes Costello syndrome and is associated with um, autism. And there's a constitutive um, uh, hypo, uh, sorry, uh, open chromatin region at this promoter site, as you'd expect. When you look at the um, the sequence in detail, it's an uh, that's transcription factor uh, canonical binding site, and you can see that to put a T into either of those positions is enormously disruptive of what the uh, transcription factor is expecting at that locus. And you can also see that the second T is in a CG context, just as we were uh, describing earlier. So what we're trying to do now is to uh, an enormous amount of work because we're doing two comparisons. One is autism versus neurotypical, and I'm not going to call, call autism a disease because that's uh, we, sensitivities with our patients about that. But within the autism group, high IQ and low IQ, and low IQ is where you start talking about pathogenesis and disease. And as you can see here, we've got a, a number of different uh, properties of, the, uh, of each of these de novo re regulatory variants, and we want to annotate them and see if there are differences um, in these 20, in, sorry, let's just say 13 cell types, we've narrowed it down, um, uh, times two comparisons, times all of these different things here. So Eric Sosa in the group has been very busy, and he's looking at things like um, the fast con score, and it looks like there could be an increase in the, um, in the, uh, conservation of these low sign the individuals with low IQ uh, versus high IQ. Um, he's also taking the uh, Philo P scores and we're doing more analysis on that. And uh, also looking at the distance of the de novo regulatory variant to a canonical transcription start site for, uh, for a gene. That's looking de novo regulatory variant by de novo regulatory variant. But what if we do it person by person, people with, with autism um, uh, in these different categories. And that will give us an indication of the genomic architecture, what needs to be present to have either the trait of autism or the low IQ. And the first clue that we have that says we're going to find something here, especially with the low IQ um, issue, is when we studied the number of de novo regulatory variants, and we chose glutamatergic neurons here because we're, we're interested in them. They're, we can create them relatively easily from IPFCs, so we think it'll be a model for us. And as you can see, these curves start moving further and further over to the left into the area of the low IQ as you have more and more of these de novo regulatory variants. So this tells us a few things. Number one, there's probably information outside the coding sequence that helps us to understand who's at risk of autism, who's at risk of low IQ autism, and it fits with an oligogenic model. It fits with the idea that you, multiple events are going to, um, in one individual, add up to an increased susceptibility or a worsened phenotype if IQ is described as, as a worsened phenotype. So how do we test these loci? Because it's all very well for us to predict stuff, but we have to close the loop and test it. Um, so this is where long read sequencing, I'm showing pack bio data here, but I want to emphasize that the, um, Oxford Nanopore appears to be a, a, an extraordinarily good technology as well, and I want to look and be neutral about that. So I have a couple of um, interesting observations here, and I need you to geek out with me for a minute, because this is this is me looking at these data and going, woo. Um, so we um, what you've probably seen uh, these kinds of data before, there are two samples here, there's blood and there's lymphoblastoid cell line, and you can resolve the haplotypes. I don't know if this is paternal or maternal, but it's one of each. And what you can see here is that there is, this is the same variant that I showed earlier from the bisulfite sequencing, having a difference in methylation on both chromosomes. But now with PAC bio data, we can look at much broader context of what's going on as opposed to the few hundred base pairs around the, the uh, nucleotide itself. So the, this minor allele, what it does is it reconstitutes a PU1 binding site. So it, this is a, an unusual situation where you actually lose methylation at the locus if you have this minor allele. Um, so that's why you see the blue, which should be only in this area here, extending downstream to uh, beyond the, the uh, methylation QTL. Um, but the normal allele is as shown here. And what you can see is I'm, I'm flagging everywhere where, where there's a polymorphism. And th this lower haplotype here is the same as this upper haplotype here in the lymphoblastoid cell lines. And that's important because when we zoom in here, I'll show you, there's the area of demethylation. So things have now turned red, uh, from red to blue, I should say. Um, 
but there's a resistant allele. There may be another one a little bit higher up, but I want you to focus on this one here. There's an allele where you don't lose the methylation despite the fact that it's in cis with this variant. You can see the, the read extending over to the variant. Now you say, oh, come on, John, that's over-interpreting it. That's looking at uh, a, a one maybe experimental artifact. But what happens when you go down here to the same haplotype in lymphoblastoid cell lines? The everything is unmethylated, is methylated despite the presence of the functional variant. And all of these cells are EBV transformed B lymphocytes. And B lymphocytes, you would expect to be present in about 5% of peripheral blood. So I am, um, this is me geeking out. I freely admit that. But I would guess that this is a B lymphocyte here. It is resistant to the spread of demethylation as it is in EBV transformed B lymphocytes. So this tells us two things. Number one is we can use this uh, five base sequencing to see where a variant is located and see a change of DNA methylation. That's so it, it picks up functional variants, but it also helps us to identify the cell subtypes in which the functional variant is active or not. And that is a deconvolution exercise that we have to um, uh, work on separately. So um, that's the, I've kind of pre jumped ahead there, obviously, but there's your punchline. So to finish, I want to um, emphasize that I want this kind of research to be happening in the Bronx so that there's no head start for European genomes. In other words, we, we don't make the mistake that we made in the GWAS era and in even the rare disease era where everything gets worked out in Europeans and then we play catch up with every other group. I don't have that option in the Bronx because I only have 9% Northern European white individuals, non-Hispanic white individuals. So if we're going to understand non-coding variation, not as a confounder of epigenetic studies, but as a source of information about phenotypes that we can use diagnostically with rare diseases and indeed with, with common diseases so we can improve our diagnostic rates. Um, this is the path forward that I see, and I'd be really interested to get uh, the uh, uh, input and active involvement in this quest from other people. So um, I have this, I'm, I'm gonna slow down a little bit and just say Marlietta Matos is extraordinary. She's been doing uh, 400 single cell RNA-seq experiments and 400 attack-seq experiments and 400 genotyping experiments on these samples from her aging project. And she is becoming really good analytically as well. She's a, she's a force. Uh, Jacob Stauber is doing work on clonal hematopoiesis. David Yang has been working on uh, what we hope to create as a new field of population epigenetics, which uh, I hopefully we'll get to tell you again about some other day. Cassidy Lundy is transdifferentiating uh, hepatic stellate cells into myofibroblasts to understand how to prevent cirrhosis in patients with liver disease. Eric is doing the autism work, and Christine is working with us on nat natural language processing um, in, um, in uh, our rare disease patients. The genome diver team, Center for Epigenomics, collaborators, New York Center for Rare Diseases, mention them, thanks to them, and thank you to you for having me here today. Hi, great. Um, I was wondering, uh, as you look, particularly as you're seeing these clusters in the, the CPG islands, um, are, are you thinking about trying to get uh, long read RNA seq for single cell to see if you're changing um, start sites uh, of some of these transcripts and, and see if that's one of the driving things in terms of, of, of changing gene expression and, and the kinds of things you're seeing in, with the genes? We hadn't thought of that. Um, yeah, thank you. That's a really interesting idea. Um, obviously, isoform use is a little bit more difficult to link to pathology um, because they're they're still meant to be all normal. Um, but if if there was something different about the sort of upstream component of the gene in terms of splicing or you know start site of the protein coding uh, component, um, 
Possibly, yeah. So, uh, so sometimes the initiation site can actually change the downstream yeah. splicing determination as well. Yeah, um, I hadn't thought of that. Thank you. That's a really interesting idea. We have a question online. Um, uh, Leslie Bissaker says, great talk, John. Going forward, what do you think are the best candidate phenotypes for an epigenetic etiology and practical clinical diagnostics? Les, I'm sorry that you're unwell. Um, and next time. Um, so if you're going to do, um, it depends on what you want to uh, Epigenetic means a lot of things. So if epigenetic in this case means you're going to use an epigenetic assay to try to understand a disease, I think there are two answers there. One is um, we could, it's going to be very difficult at the functional genomics level to be able to say, I can predict this particular sequence change to be uh, changing the function of this regulatory element. Um, it, because you'll never see it twice if it's a very rare event. So if you are, say, crispering in these individual nucleotides into a locus to try to understand their, their effects, these epigenomic assays could actually help you because they'll, it, you may have a common outcome of all of these variants and that they, you lose the regulatory locus or it opens up the chromatin or whatever it might be. So it will kind of collapse the information from the individual rare variants down to um, a common output of uh, the chromatin structure has changed um, or the DNA methylation has changed. So I think th those assays could be helpful from that point of view. Um, as regards just taking DNA methylation data and using it for um, understanding how to predict diseases, there's really nice work being performed by Aaron Halpern and Noah Zaitlin in UCLA. And what they're doing is they're taking uh, samples of blood from patients in the UCLA health system and they are. Um, doing DNA methylation assays, while they also look at the genotypes of those individuals. So the classical approach, classical meaning last few years, um, is uh, to do polygenic risk scores and associated with those risks. They're finding that the DNA methylation risk scores are outperforming the, the polygenic risk scores. And that's probably because the DNA methylation is already influenced to some extent by the um, DNA sequence variation. So it's probably capturing some of that variation, but it's also probably having um, reading out things like cell subtype effects and perhaps cellular reprogramming as well that are um, uh, re uh, adding information that you don't get from the genotype on its own. So I think that those would be the two things that I'd particularly be interested in. Dave. Yeah, great talk. Um, so I was getting the title of your book and actually the cover there where you have, you know, genetics and the word we're not going to use, mm -hmm. but, um, and I've always kind of looked at the chromatin architecture as dynamic. So, you know, you have a transcription factor binding, you open the chromatin, things get into modify the DNA. Um, and here you have this great pool of variants in New York, and it looks like you're putting all those things together. But is that dynamic model of chromatin structure leading to downstream events, whatever they may be, is that the model you're testing or are you waiting for that to kind of emerge as a conclusion? There's a lot in that, isn't there? Um, I think that we are making the assumption right now that there's a, a reference epigenome, no matter what your ancestry is. But if we know that sequence variants exist between individuals and populations, and that sequence variation can influence whether the chromatin is open or not, just as a shorthand for regulatory locus, um, it's quite possible that polymorphism of the regulatory landscape exists between individuals and could be linked to ancestry and uh, your, well, ancestry, in which case, we can't go in there with the assumption that if you're black or Hispanic or whatever it might be, population in the Bronx, that there is an open chromatin locus here just because it was shown in a cell line from a, you know, the one we use is from a white woman in Italy. Um, so uh, uh, I think we need to go in there and make these discoveries independently in each group. What I'm not sure of is whether I've answered your question. Uh, yeah, you kind of got to it. Um, the, the question is, um, I refined the question a little bit. Um, the, I would think that just like you're saying, you're going to have these 
genetic variants that lead to downstream consequences. But um, do you think there's going to be an order of operation? Are you going to open the chromatin yeah. first or are you going to do something else first? Yeah, it. so... I'm, I'm not really talking about the context of disease. I'm yeah. just talking about which the, the actual you know, chicken egg biochemistry. Of, yeah. Um, Mark Tashney um, is very interesting on the topic of epigenetics. Um, but what Mark has told me, which I thought was very interesting, is that these so called pioneer transcription factors uh, like AP1 um, are, you know, they're distinctive because they can open up the chrom chromatin, they can get in there, they can recruit remodelers. Um, but as Mark says, if you overexpress any transcription factor highly enough, it'll get in there and it'll cause the same effect. So um, that may be hyper hyper hyperbole. There may be some that actually don't. But um, the, the idea that um, pretty well any locus can be opened up by the binding specifically of a DNA binding protein, um, uh, presumably with the recruitment of the appropriate complexes, um, makes me feel that it's probably a generalizable um, uh, phenomenon. How DNA methylation and DNA sequence polymorphism works at that stage becomes interesting because um, I think DNA methylation probably exists blanketing the genome to reduce the space that the transcription factor can actually bind to easily. Um, and DNA sequence variation obviously is going to influence uh, this ability as well. And the other thing that we always talk about, we always talk about transcription factors acting individually. They don't, they act as cis regulatory modules. So it's, you know, there are some things that Chris Black and UCSD are showing that terrify me where he he shows in his different lines of mice that have polymorphism at these loci that there are some places where he just doesn't see a transcription factor binding in black six or whatever it is but there's no sequence variant there that, that explains it so my worry is that there's probably it could be the effect of something which is coming together with it in three-dimensional space and it's even more complex than just the three transcription factors he thought were binding at that locus so complex I think we have one more question online one more question. Um, how would long read sequencing of people, population studies like the new data release from all of us today be helpful in this future work? Sounds like Dr. Denny is on the line. Um, uh, the, um, obviously, if you're making the assumption that the structure of a locus is some canonical structure um, and you're wrong about that, um, uh, in people who are of different ancestries to whoever was used to make that original uh, uh, canonical genome, um, then everything downstream is, is going to be affected, right? You're going to have your chromatin studies and your, your DNA methylation studies and everything influenced by that. So not only is the um, long read sequencing going to help us with the understanding of, of what could be variable in your individual patient with their individual ancestry, but if you're reading out DNA methylation at the same time, you'll be able to say, not only do I see a variant here, I also see a change of DNA methylation. And one of the great things about rare variants is you have the other DNA haplotype for comparison. The joke, uh, medical joke, um, orthopedic surgeons, why do we have two arms? So the orthopedic surgeon has a, a normal one to compare to. Um, the, we have, if we have a, a, a sequence that has not got the variant, it's a wonderful comparison because it's within the same cell. They've had the same environmental influences. They're at the same cell stage of the cell cycle and so on. So having, um, having, uh, long read sequencing, reading out the DNA methylation at the same time is going to be a first clue as to whether the variants in that locus could be influencing the regulatory properties of that locus. Okay, so we're a little after the hour. We'll end things there. So thank you all for attending and thank you for an absolutely wonderful talk. Thank you.